All right. Let's see. Um, if um, the Mata family, what year? What year did you come? And what year did your mom pass away? Oh, one year? So if they were one year late in coming to this church, one year late of not opening, uh, you know, H.D. Daniel's heart to come here, then she, that opportunity on that deathbed would not be there. I just have to really think about this, you know. Um, H.D. Mata family came here in 2014 on the, uh, by the lead of, of, of Daniel, right? So he's, he's the one, um, you know, he's looking on the internet, he's looking for some answers for his life. I think they were living in a box. Just kidding. <laughs> But he was looking for some, I don't know all the things that were going behind uh, before that, but I, there was a lot of things happening, of course. And he found Pastor Kim's books online, right? And then he gave me a call one day, and I told him to come by. He, you know, he lived in Fresno. Uh, was it three hours from there? From Fremont? Three hours? Three hours. So he came three hours with his family. Um, you know, by then the kids were small. I think Joshua was, how old are you? 14? Yeah, 14. And so um, they didn't have tongue. HD, Ellen didn't really know about the charismatic type of church. I don't know if she knew tongue. Did you, did you know about tongue? She knew about tongue, but she didn't know tongue. They didn't really know the Bible. They just know that they are living in a certain way. And maybe they thought that was normal. But if H.T. Daniel didn't drag his family here, I don't know if, if H.T. Allen resisted him. He'd resist. No. So at least that was good. Because <laughs> sometimes, you know, you wives might resist. So she didn't resist. She just came along, you know, uh, but it was H.D. Daniel who found the church, brought him here, and it was probably a shocker, right? To those who don't know the testimony, you know, basically we pray for them. God touched H.D. Ellen first, and Daniel, who found the ministry and church, didn't feel anything. Right? So it was like, like he, do you feel anything? No. He didn't get no tongue. He didn't feel no fire. He just like, what's going on? And his wife is the one that the spirit fell on. She's speaking in tongues, and I forget what other things happen. And then, you know, the word comes. So we had to take him into the kitchen because it, it was at the other property. We took him into the kitchen, and we took H.D. Daniel first, and you know, God's telling us, uh, you cheat on your wife? Imagine that. Right? You're the husband. You're trying to find a new life for your family. And you find the church. And then the first thing God asks you is, hey, we still have some things to resolve. Remember that part when you cheated on your wife? And at that time, H.T. Uh, Allen didn't know. You didn't know, right? You knew? Okay, she knew. <laughs> she knew, so maybe that's why God brought it out in the open that way at that time. So she knew, so she's probably miserable, right, from that experience, and it's not resolved. And, you know, if you look at, in hindsight, if you look at all the things that happens in your life, regardless of what happens, and you may think it's bad, you may think it's good, but if it gets you to a certain place, right, I mean, isn't that what matters? If, if, if it gets you to heaven, isn't that what matters? Right? Would, you, would it be better to live happy, rich, like the Jones in some really good neighborhood and never come to know God? Or is it better to live where you endured and suffered a lot? You had a lot of headaches, but, you've, but, you've, but God found you and, and you ended up in heaven, right? Which is better? 
You have to always take the bigger picture. I know that's not easy, but you have to remind yourself, right? You have to constantly remind yourself. So we brought HD Daniel in, he confessed, then we brought the wife in, right? And you know, we had a little meeting with the four of them. And you know, HD Daniel confessed, opened up his heart and and that started the ball, right? That finally started, that is, that's the turn, you see. Getting to the church was one turn, and then confessing and resolving that was another turn. And that turn, or those turns, put them now on the path of truth. What if, what if God, said, God brought that up and, and H.T. Daniel got offended and like, or denied it? No, 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 that's, you know, we have people like that. We, you know, God gives us a word and people just straight out deny right in front of the throne. No, no, no. That just puts the brakes on us then, you know, it's like, okay, what do I, then we're, we can't go anywhere after that. If people don't want to confess and come open, then we're like, okay, where do we go now? We got nowhere to go, right? You, they've blocked us. They, 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 they're basically saying we don't want the help. Because we're, we'll stay in our pride and we'll, we'll, we'll not humble ourselves and, and there's, you know, we don't want other people listening because they're, they're, they're around, they might listen to what, you know, being prophesied or what's being spoken. And you know, through the years, through the years, we get a word, we can pray for someone, we get a word and we'll ask them, you know, God is kind of saying this or that. And a lot of times they're like, no. But we've learned this, yes. We've learned this, yes. That a lot of times, in fact, almost all the time, what we get is accurate. And a lot of times those people who say no, they left anyway. Right? They don't want to be exposed. You see, the guy with the one talent, he, uh, afraid and hid. That's what Adam did. Right? That's, that's what, when I looked at the word, that's what... Highlight. That's what Adam did. Adam was, what did he say to God? I'm afraid. And so we hid. And he thinks, so that's what a lot of people do. You, you're afraid of truth being revealed because we're afraid of what people might know of you, your weaknesses, your story. And so you'll hide spiritually out of that fear. You're hiding. See, you're not actually crawling up under a rock. Maybe if there was, you might. But you're spiritually hiding, and therefore you're moving, you're moving away from the light of God, where light is to expose you. So when God came out and Adam runs, you know, he's running away from the light where his problems can't be exposed to be dealt with. So now he's covering figs on his own, out of his own strength. We'll take care of this on our own, God. And that's what most people do. They try to take care of it on their own first. And they continue. And their lives become worse or no change and, 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 and instead of humbling themselves they continue to hit their head on the wall you know it's like when you're going to get it because they think that eventually they're going to make to the other side one day that one last hit right one last effort on their own is, is they're going to get through and people die. People think Jesus is coming in their lifetime. They're all dead. Zero for thousands of years. They're, they're all batting zero. And they're all wrong. Okay, Every single generation before us, they're wrong. Jesus didn't come. Why do you want to jump on that bandwagon when the odds are stacked against you trying to figure out when Jesus is coming? He says, clearly in the Bible in Acts chapter 1, not your business. Right? So, if H.T. Daniel didn't come in 2014, 
Mom's going to die one year after, okay, 2015. That scene would not be there. His mom would have just died, never hearing those last few words, which are food, which are life, right? The word is food, okay? And when he fed her and gave her that, those words, mom don't, you know, because she had the other guy, the religious guy come in and say, oh, you did this, you did that, you did that. Now that could be true, okay? She, that could be true. Maybe that's what she did and maybe that's what happened. But you see, at that moment, it doesn't matter. That delivery, that, that, that message isn't for that moment. So perhaps God also allowed it for the religious guy to come and just beat her up so that she can now be more receptive to her son. Because a lot of times, you know, the moms and the dads are not going to be very receptive to the sons or the daughter trying to tell them, you know, what's right or truth, right? So maybe they got to get beat up a little first. So when she's in that emotional beat up state, now here comes her son to console her and so she'll be more receptive, right? So if you get beat up, you're more receptive to submit, right? If you physically get beat up, that is, you know, you are going to be more receptive. Even the Bible says that, right? You don't listen, you're going to get beating on your back. Proverbs, by the way. <laughs> And her mom, or sorry, his mom, his mom, on the last train, made it to heaven because of what her son did, what her daughter-in-law did. One choice, one moment, one right or left, one word can be life or death for somebody, for you, for your family, for your descendants, for your whole family maybe. If we take things to, for granted, right, and we don't understand how powerful that one choice can be, one decision can be, right? One choice, you know, you make a wrong turn, you're going into the bad neighborhood of, you know, of, our na of this area, whether it's, you know, Richmond, Vallejo, Oakland, there's some bad areas. There's some good areas, of course, yes, but there's some bad areas there, too. So you make a wrong, wrong turn, now you're dealing with some gangsters, like, what are you doing on my street, right? It's like you make a wrong spiritual turn, now you're dealing with a bunch of demons, like, oh, welcome. And they start messing with you. One turn. Because you're either too lazy to look at the map. Because you want my say, oh, no, 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 I don't need to look at the map. I know where I'm going. You know, that's how a lot of men are, right? We know where I'm going. And then you just try to find it out a random choice. Or one right turn, one proper turn, and you're home. Familiar territory. Good neighborhood. Right? Nice people. Uh, that one right or one proper turn is like your turn to the church here. Or you can end up in a different church and you can think it's all the same. Well, not every family is the same. Not every company is the same. Not every country is the same. Not every individual is the same. I'm not saying we're perfect and I'm not saying we're absolutely right, but you know, I think we showed enough evidence and fruit that we are on the right road. Right? To make it to all the way, well, you know, we all got to work on that, okay? To, to, for anybody to say, this is it, we're it, you know, I think you're speaking out of pride and you might already be on the wrong road then. Even though it looks okay, you have to keep yourself in check, you know? Every day we're challenged, right? One word mess you up. One word, mess your day up. One act, one look, one attitude. I think about stuff like that a lot these days, you know. 
One turn, bam, accident, right? And you could be crippled. One bad, prideful, ignorant decision while you're driving. And boom, your whole life, your whole life is now affected. You see, because we've made right choices and nothing has really happened really bad, we, we start taking granite for it, thinking everything's going to be fine, and then you don't realize it's that when you slip up, you know, when you, when you get big-headed, and then boom, and now you're, now you're going to get humbled, right? So I want you guys to think, okay, and I want you to think really hard. Even though you're in this church, doesn't mean you're actually in this church, right? First battle is to get here, or even in any church, for many Christians, because, you know, one is to get out of their beds and to actually go to church. That's the first battle. Second battle is you got to actually find the right church. You saw Ezekiel, right? God's like, you know what? We're not playing games anymore. I'm going to preach like like, you know, it's like you've already had the, the easy preaching now. Now we're going to the meat and bread. And that's how we feel like this, this as we move over to the next decade, right? It's, you've already had enough food. You guys grown enough, at least for our people who've been here for a while, you've, you've grown enough. You know, it's like talking to my children, you know, when they're at a certain age, they know right and wrong already, right? Stop, stop testing the line. Stop testing the parents. Something's going to take, get taken away from you, right? Or you're going to get in trouble out there because you keep thinking you're invincible. And if you don't make the right choice, someone's going to die. And when I say die, I don't mean just like this, die in this church. I'm talking about your families or your parents that you want to go to heaven. Do you understand? You're the one who's building this ark for them. Noah built the ark, okay? It was up to him. If he don't build it, his family dies. That burden rested on his shoulder. You're building the spiritual ark. Well, what about my mom and dad? Well, when your ark is done, God will, go, God will go get them. But if your ark is not done and time now catches up to you, what are you going to do? You're going to blame God when, when we're wasting time here, right? Wasting time. You know, you guys have, you know, the church, you know, a lot of our people, even here or out there, you got you to be real. You know, not re you guys are not real. Like, He's trying to, he's trying to, trying to catch up with the Jones or trying to um, impress me. Like, you know, oh yeah, we're doing this, we're doing that, we're praying, we're reading. No, you're not. Can't you just be real? You know, on the prayer band, everybody gets one hour down. Everybody. No one's going to put 10 minutes, 5 minutes. Right? Because it's too embarrassing. They're going to put one hour like everybody else. How they conjure that up, I don't know. But you know what? They got it somehow. Yeah, one hour. Everybody's doing it, one hour. Oh, yeah, they're all reading 30 minutes. Let me put that. 30 minutes also. I can't put down, I only read one chapter a day. You're shortchanging yourself, okay? You're not shortchanging me. Nobody else really reads. You know, all the other people in that prayer band, they don't read really each other's posts. I'm the only one who's reading everybody's thing, and I don't read it all the time anyway, right? That's for your own accountability. You guys are all adults, right? You do it, you don't do it, you know, it's up to you. You don't want to keep the commandments, that's on you. I teach it, and it's up to you. If I teach that, hey, in this ministry, you keep the fourth commandment. If you want to go shopping and spend money on Sunday when you're not allowed to do it, that's on you. Because I've already told you. You don't want to tithe, you don't want to offer when I've already told you that's the commandment of the Lord, and you don't want to do it, that's on you. Period. You're the one who's not going to get blessed. You understand how revelation, how all that works? Malachi chapter 3. They're not tithing, okay? He's like, you're stealing from me. How are we stealing from you, God? That's how Christians say. What are we doing, God? What am I doing wrong? You're stealing from me. No, we're tithing. God's like, I'm not talking about right now. I'm talking about the, all the other weeks or the other years you weren't tithing. 
But the babies will go, no, we're tithing. I'm not talking about last month. I'm talking about two months ago. We are praying. I'm not talking about now. I'm talking about three months ago. The context, right? People are trying to answer within their own definition, but not the context of the question of the person who's asking it. If God is asking you a question, you need to, you need to figure out, all right, what is God asking based on what he's trying to tell me rather than what I want to tell him to make other people believe that I'm doing what I say I am. You see? Malachi chapter 3, 10, if you haven't read Malachi, only four chapters, okay? Right before Matthew. 400 years, silence. Malachi to Matthew, 400 years, God's not speaking to his people. They're all a bunch of thieves, okay? They're all a bunch of sinners, and they think they're not, like, offending God, and God's like, you're offending me. You're stealing from me. We're not stealing from you. We are tithing and offering. God's like, I'm not talking about that you did it last week. I'm talking about for all the months you haven't done it. All the years that you haven't done it. That's what God is saying. And he says, bring the tithes into my storehouse. First, the only place where he's like, test me, right? Test me. Test me. See what's going to happen. I'm going to open the doors of heaven, right? I'm going to open the doors of heaven, and then I'll rebuke the locusts. Okay, so you have two levels here, okay? Two levels. First level, the tithing opens up the windows of heaven or the doors of heaven. If you're a thief, you're not going to get any revelation. The doors of heaven, I'm going to pour down so much from heaven, he says, right? Go to, go to Malachi chapter 3. Go to verses, uh, I think, 10 and after. Let's read it. It's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pour down so much that you can't contain it. Do you know if you go to a church and they don't teach tithing, and though you got a bunch of greedy people and thieves in that church... You know what you're going to notice? No revelation. No revelation. You, you know why this church has revelation? Because, there, because most of us here, we're all generous to God. That's why. Uh, verse 10, let's start there. Bring, okay, let's go to 8. Okay, you have cheated me. Let's go to eight. Should people cheat God? Yet you have cheated me. The natural response of any of people is, what do you mean? Right? That's the natural response of people. What do you mean? When did we ever cheat you, God? I tied, I tied last week. I was like, I'm not talking about last week. I'm talking about two weeks ago, two months ago. Well, I tied three weeks ago. I'm talking about four weeks ago. You have cheated me of the tithes and offerings due to me. Tithing, 10%, belongs to God, just like the government takes their portion, right? Tithing, God says in the Bible, comes to the place you worship and you are fed. It's not a place where you define based on your own decision, saying, okay, I'm going to give this, this poor guy here, this guy on the street here, to that family, and I'm going to consider it my tithe. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible doesn't say that you get to make your own decisions. On the offering, you want to make a decision of giving some of your money away, that's on you. But on the tithing, God said, this is mine. You do not have an option or your own decision where it goes. He said, tithes belong where you worship and where you are fed. Pastor Kim actually touches this and he's like, his example was, you come and eat in my house and you, or if I own a restaurant, you come and eat at my restaurant, you go go pay some other restaurant. When did we ever cheat you? You cheated me of tithes and offering due to me. Verse 9, you are under a curse. See, see you, you, do, you don't tie, you're under automatic curse. But tithes are under the law, they say. No, it's not. Tithes was given before the law. 
Abraham gave a tenth to Melchizedek, who is the Prince of Peace, and it gave Melchizedek a tenth to stay in the blessing, not to get the blessing. Okay? You don't do this, you're out of the blessing. You're under a curse for your whole family has been cheating me. Okay? Nation, church, family, individual, whatever. Ten. So God's like, okay, you know what? Just do right. We don't like to Cain. Just do right and, and everything will be fine. Bring all your tithes into my storehouse so there's enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's army, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. So the, you know, the windows of heaven, we're not talking about physical finances here right now. We're talking about spiritual blessings. Okay? Not just revelation. Peace, joy, love, all that is all coming down from the throne. Your crops will be abundant. That means your finances, your job, your business will be abundant. For I will guard them from insects and disease. Insects and disease are represented by the demons, right? And the disease are curses. Your grapes will not fall from the vine before they arrive. It means before you get paid, no debt collector is going to come and take your money away. That's what it means. Says the Lord of heavens of army. Twelve, then all nations will call you blessed for your land will be such a delight, says the Lord of heaven. Thirteen, you have said terrible things about me, says the Lord. Okay. Um, which version is that? I should go back to twelve. Oh, it's it's kind of short, but eleven, eleven. Let's go back to eleven. Okay. So, so there's two folds, right? You have the windows of heaven opening up for revelation, and then you have the physical blessing, which is described here as your um, vine or your farm, and God's going to protect it from the insect and diseases, which is uh, from the demons and the uh, curses. Now, if you read prior to the verses, God actually said, I'm the one who sends the curse. Okay? I'm the one who sends the curse. And then he's also one that rebukes them. So God sent his people to Babylon, and then he judged Babylon. You see how, that, you see how God works? He actually sent his people to Babylon. Babylon, you know, Nebuchadnezzar, he's like, they're my servants. They're my, they're my, they're my hammer. And then, and then after God dealt with his people, God judged Babylon for, for messing with his people. How's that work? You see, God judged Babylon for messing with his people. But yeah, God sent them to him. But at the same time, if you read the scripture, God says, you know, Babylon, you over discipline my people. You're too harsh to them. So he went after them. So if you look at any church, a church that is generous with a lot of generous people, you're also going to have a lot of revelation in that church. And as an individual, if you're, not a, if you're not a generous person tithing an offer, you're going to lack revelation as well. And it doesn't count that you're, you're generous in one season and then you hold back in other seasons. It doesn't count. You're just, you're just ruining your crop. Whether you're offended or not offended at the pastors or, you, or whoever, you got you know, you to pay your taxes. This is God's taxes. That's what it was down to. You don't like the U.S. government, their policies, doesn't mean that you say, no, I'm not paying taxes today. No, you can't. And God's requirement is higher than taxes. And so if, 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 the, if the Uncle Sam is going to tax you at gross, you need to tithe off your gross and not your net. Because then you're shortchanging and ripping God off. Amen? Okay. Why'd I go that way? All right. Anyway. For a lot of you, your parents are not getting any younger. You know, before, um, you know, the, when the Matas got here, to me, they were kind of troublemakers. And we didn't actually think that they were going to be ahead of the race, we, we thought they would still be behind the race, but 
when H.T. Daniel reminded the story about his mom, you know, it was like, oh, God already knew you're going to come ahead of the race. That's why God saved his mom. You see, my wife, Pastor Eugene, says, I feel it in my spirit. God's going to save your mom. And you know my mom's crazy, right? She don't look savable. She's hurt a lot of people. She said a lot of bad things. She's, oh, it's, but you know, I mean, was she worse than me? We're all the same. But God's going to save her because I'm doing his work. And I'm going to remind you again what God told my wife and I. He's like, because you're taking care of my children, I'm going to take care of your children. Right? Because we put a lot of effort into the church, and sometimes it can look like we're neglecting the needs of our kids, even though their needs are not being neglected. But perhaps maybe they don't feel, because everybody feels they're shortchanged in some way or the other, right? But God says, you know, when I look at my kids, I'm like, they, I, to me it's like, you know, when I was 15, I, I knew how to, you know, I, I was 12, okay, let me put it that way, 12, 13. I'm working the grocery store that my dad bought. I'm doing inventory. I'm doing the cashier. I'm selling liquor, okay, at age 13 because I'm the cash register clerk. And then, you know, they send the, the, the cops on me, of course. We got caught. I didn't know. I was like, I don't know. Man. I'm, just, I'm just ringing the register. They just find you. It's not a big deal. My mom used to sell liquor to the underage to survive. She forced me to sell liquor to the underage. No one's looking. No one's looking. Teenagers, high schools come, right? They knew that we're the place to go. She's a Christian. Right? She's going to church. Taking me to church, and now we're selling liquor to underage kids. Because in her mind, we have to survive. But see, she's, she's religious. She's, she have never really came. You know when my dad died, and, you know, it could have been afterward, but she had tongue, and I hear her tongue, and, and, and God really showed her that I'm going to take care of you, but it's like a lot of Christians. You, you know it here. You might have experienced a little bit of it, but you can never go all the way with the trust of the Lord, Right? You still a thought of doubt comes. Still, you see with your senses in the physical realm, and you're like, oh, maybe not. You know, and that's natural. That thought's always going to come to your mind. Doubt's going to always come to your mind. You're always going to get challenged. Maybe even the thoughts, is God even real? Right? I'm, those thoughts come to my mind too. Is God real? Maybe we're being shammed. You gotta constantly f fight the nonsense that's entering your mind. <laughs> but if some of your parents die, and you don't get a chance to go give a few words or last words to them, then you know you're gonna pastor. Then you're gonna go pastor. You know our senior pastor. He's bishop right now, by the way. Okay, you're gonna go bishop. Give. Oh, can you tell me my mom or dad's never believe that? You know what he's gonna tell you? Should I tell you what he's gonna tell you? You have to also accept reality. Okay. My dad is not in heaven. My grandma, who was Catholic, my grandpa, who was basically an atheist, my grandma prayed for me every single day for hours using her little rosary. And I don't know what she prayed. You know, she could be chanting. I don't know. She prayed that I get the perfect wife. And when she found that I was marrying my current wife, she flipped. And then, you know, she's praying for, basically, she's not praying for my salvation. She's praying that I just become a successful, you know, person in life. And when I was in Michigan and the word came that she died, God's like, I'm not going to allow you to go to the funeral because they're all a bunch of idol worshippers. You know, they're all Catholic. 
Because at first I was going to go. At first I wasn't going to go. Then I decided, okay, I'll go. Because everybody's putting pressure on me. Then we said, okay, I'll go. And then God stopped us or stopped me. Because this is from Michigan, right? And, and I decided to deal with the wrath of my family. I was better than the wrath of God. And when I came back to California, my dad is, is buried up there in the Santa Clara Hills with my grandma and grandpa. And ever since I got back, I never went to the cemetery. I did go there to drive around just to tell my relatives I've been there. <laughs> but once they're dead, they're dead. Okay? They're dead. They're either in heaven or hell. And they can't hear you. They can't, they can't, you know, you, you know you're, you're almost close to ancestor worshiping. When you all die, I'm going to burn you. <laughs> Cremate. It's cheaper. Then I'm going to throw your ashes and go, goodbye. Finally, goodbye. <laughs> oh, good. At least you're home. Okay. Thank you. Go. Oh, you want to be in the ocean? Okay, go. <laughs> Toilet? Okay, we'll do that too. <laughs> Death should be celebration, okay? If you make it to heaven, you should be celebrating. And I don't need to go to your cemetery and cry over you because you're not there, right? You're in heaven. But if, if my dad and my grandparents didn't make it, that's just the way it is. You know, and the revelation that God gave to me after 40 years is that if God didn't remove my dad, I would not be here. You don't think God will remove your parents? You read, you haven't read the Bible. God removed, you know, Judge, uh, Judah's two boys, killed them. Because they were wicked as far as God was concerned. If, if, you know, you have to look at the bigger picture. If God's coming for you as an individual and your parents are in the way because they want to stay pagan, I mean, you got to look at the bigger picture and go, wow, you know, Man, God is coming for me. He's, he's going to move mountains. He's going he's gonna to move the seas. He's going to create earthquakes because he's coming for me. But we're going to have a little pity party. Oh, no, you took away my parents or you get me hurt. Oh, you, my brother, my sister. Mini me. Where's my mini me? I'm not trying to be insensitive, bro, okay? But you, you have to look at the bigger picture, okay? Your father, okay? Your father has come for you. And everybody else in your family, it's not really your family, okay? They're just like, you know, when you grow up, you don't even see each other anymore, right? That's what, this what happens. I haven't seen my uncles for... 20 years, <laughs> ever since I left from Michigan. And they don't care. I don't care either. They got their own lives. They got their own kids. They got their own grandson. They got their own business. Everybody moves on, right? You know who keeps it together? The grandmas. And once the grandma dies, it's over. Everybody's gone their own ways. Oh, I got a brother, sister, cousin here and there. I don't know what they're doing. Grandma dies, it's done. Everybody split up. You become your own tribes. Some of you get mad and become enemies, fight over money, fight over inheritance, become enemies. You don't even brothers and sisters anymore, right? You got to look at the bigger picture. You, you know, you're, you, we're all here because God has chosen you. And, and based on your decision is whether your family members will get saved or not. If you come to the church, and there's many stories in the Bible, if you come to the church for your own conniving motive or power, for position, for money, you're going to bring a curse upon you and your whole family and maybe even your generations. You know, you should read the book of Judges if you haven't read the book of Judges. 
It's very scary in there, okay? You have God's people, the tribes of Israel, the Bible says in the book of Judges, they have no king, okay? They're, everybody is their own king. They, they're their own decision-making process, right? Just like H.D. Uh, uh, Daniel said, you know, you look at the society and, and during the hippie generation, right? Everybody's becoming a little rebellious. They want to be their own decision-making. So in culture, what is fed to you is like be your own person, be independent, right? Capitalism, now that sounds good, we're all getting wealthy, it looks right. Democracy, let's vote, let's all vote and get along. This is a village, take the village. That's the world talking to you. It sounds good. Okay, it sounds good. Yeah, let's take a village. We got a village at APC house going on too. <laughs> he thinks the village get too big though. Right, so it sounds good, but that's not God's ways. All right, God's way is monarchy, kingdom, king, and it comes down the line, right? You have to be, every single one, under authority. As a child, you're under the authority of your parents. As an adult, a citizen, you're under the authority of your government, your country, right? You'd rather be a you know, a person without a country? Would that be better? You don't want to listen to the laws and you, like, you have no home country? You're just a wanderer? Think of that spiritually. You're a wanderer spiritually like Cain if you don't put yourself under authority. Every church ministry is like a kingdom, right? The pastors are the governors of those kingdoms. In the Old Testament, you know, they only had so many people, so they had one country. Now you have a global amount of people and so you, God is working through all these churches or kingdoms, if you will. But at the same time, if you look at the stories of the tribes, these tribes, they're not really submitting to God. They know about God. They're doing their own thing. They got idols. They got, they got their own you know, way of life. And they know they're God's people. But, but they're, they're even, you know, even in the tribe of Benjamin, you know, they're all a bunch of homosexuals, right? They're raping. The one priest comes with his concubine, and, and they're like, nigga, give us the priest. You know, the homosexuals are like, give us the priest. Priest throws the concubine out. How's it? Go figure on that story, right? Throws a concubine out. They rape her. She dies. He goes, let's go. Like it's nothing, right? Come on, let's go, concubine. You know, it means girlfriend, really. Let's go, girlfriend. She's dead. So you know what he does? Because he's a psychopath. He chops her up into 12 pieces. Do you know this story? Okay, he's a priest of God. Then he mails them off on UPS to the other tribes. Said, so Benjamin is corrupted. We need to do something. So you have the tribes of Israel gathering up against their own brother, Benjamin. And they ask God, who shall we send first? And God is actually answering them. And then the first war, like 20,000 die. And at the end, 600 Benjamins are left of the whole tribe. 600. And Paul's from Benjamin, right? He, was, he almost went extinct. Tribe of Dan is not even in the book anymore, right? Tribe of Reuben, they're not in there, all corrupted. You don't think you'll get replaced by somebody else? Tribes get replaced. You see, we, we don't respect God enough. Because if you did, you would know him. You would do your best to know who your father is. That would show some respect at least, right? Spending time reading to know the word, knowing the character of what he's capable of, what, and what you as a person, you're capable of. Because whatever those people do in the Bible, that's you. That's still in you. The Adam is in you. The Eve is in you. You see? And so, but the bigger picture is God of his mercy and love is always trying to fix us, you know? put us back on the right road. And he's not going to hold those things against you as long as you turn. You hold it against yourself. 
We carry the baggage, right? You know, you carry your baggage, you carry your past, and you try to bring it along, just like they did in the wilderness, bringing their star gods and god of Molech. You know, Molech is a fire god. They would throw their babies into the fire. I said that in the Bible, right? These gods are like, you know, you bring me sacrifice, do you think you really gave it to me? That's what God is saying. He's like, you're giving me your tithes and offering. You think you're really giving it to me? No, you're giving it to bribe me so you can get blessed out of your greed rather than giving it to me out of respect and appreciation. I should read the Bible. When you read the Bible, it gets some fear in you, right? Then maybe we'll respect God. And when you respect God, everything starts flowing right. Because you're going to run from sin, all right? You're, you're going to think twice before you like, oh yeah, whatever, I'll just do whatever I want. You know too much now, right? You can go to a Baptist church and do what you want. You know how they are. They're messed up. You go to a Catholic church, they're messed up too. They're all, a lot of them are just abusing the little boys and girls or whatever, right? I mean, the Christian churches do it too. It's a messed up world, right? Regardless, though, you know what? Every single one of you, I hope you're not wasting time because, you know, your parents are not getting old or younger. Your brothers and sisters are not getting younger. You're not getting younger. I'm getting younger. I'm 53, by the way. And I look 20. <laughs> You've seen a 60-year-old come, like that Chinese guy? Oh, he looked 80. He's almost dead. <laughs> you look almost dead. You are almost dead, okay? You could be 50 years old and you look almost dead. I, that's showing me you're almost dead. You better get on that Bible treadmill, okay, and start repenting. It, it does reflect, okay, your, your health, your glow, your, you know, it, it reflects on your, the status of your life. If you're miserable... Your body's going to be miserable and it's going to want to die because you probably want to die. If you're full of joy, your body's going to be full of joy. You're, all your body cells are going to yeah, I'm so happy. <laughs> and then you're going to look young. Because you see, sin made you look old. Sin making us look old, right? And, you know, for some of us who've been here a long time, you go to try the other churches now. Right? Some of you have been there already like, oh, it's like suffocating, right? And then you look at the people who's like 50, like my age, and like, you look 70, man. But they look normal now, right? To themselves, they look normal. To us, we're like, now you can see a contrast. Right? You see a contrast. So, you know, please don't waste time. Hmm? You're, you're going to fall into the trap like, like, the attitude that you have with worldly stuff, whether it's your business, your job, cleaning the house, cleaning the room, project, writing a paper, asking for a raise, getting another job, what happens? You keep pulling it off, right? You know that you have certain things to do to better your life, but here comes a thought, ah, uh, tomorrow. Let's do it tomorrow. Right? Because either you're scared or the application looks scary to you. Like you got big eyes and say, okay, don't write on me. Or the way of life that you have right now, you don't know any other. So you're like, I don't know anything beyond this. Maybe you're not used to prayer, so you're like, well, you know, get up and pray, right? You don't know the word? Well, start reading, you know, at least one chapter a day. That's what I did as a 12-year-old, one chapter a day. It took me two years, okay, one chapter. It don't count if you read for one month, and then you stop for three months, and then you got to be told, what are you doing? Why are you not reading? Right? You guys are all adults. Come on. Not five-year-olds. Maybe you are. Who knows? Right? You're, it's, it's your life. You want to live? Right? You want to live, right? I'm like, one, two, three. Are you alive? Pray. Read. That's what 
what God is doing for you guys, all right? You guys, don't, some people just don't want to live. Like, oh, no, I am too. You, I like this. That's what we're doing. That's what God is doing, literally. Who, who, who? You know, through his, through directly or indirectly through people. But if you, some of you who want to take the leadership role and, and become paramedics, you will be greatly blessed because it is another world <laughs> dealing with people, right? It's your choice, one choice. One choice to continue, one choice not to. One word, one moment, one opportunity. The opportunity came for HD because he obeyed God. And that one year for him to stay here, he prayed for one year for that situation to be manifested and answered by God. And his mom, you know, HD, his life wasn't, you know, wasn't like spectacular. He had a lot of problems too. Family had problems, right? They had, a lot, they had their own problems, but at the end of the day, we all got problems, right? But at the end of the day, it's, it's, it doesn't matter, right? It's to go home. Forgive and go home. Let's have a burrito and go home. Come on. Hmm? Pinto and cheese. Pinto bean. Right? I mean, when you get to heaven, it's going to be like, oh, you're not going to care anymore. Right? I mean, that's how we have to be. I know it's hard. Okay. I know it's hard sometimes. Because you want to like, oh, I'm going to kill you. you know, we want to kill each other. Right? Some of you probably hit him. Ah! Ah! Go to church. Hallelujah. Holy. What's wrong with your hand? I'm not saying it's easy. It's not. But you have to continuously make the right choice. All right? You have to force yourself. You have to be determined based on God's definition and not your definition. You cannot tell God, you cannot tell me that I did. You know, you can't be like Saul. I did obey. Yeah, he obeyed to his definition of what he thought was important. I killed all the Amalekites, but you know, the cows, what's so big about that? It's not about what you think is important. It's about who giving you the instruction that you need to complete, right? I've been trying to think, all right, so Saul, King Saul didn't make it to heaven. Why? He didn't kill the cows or the ox, sheep, whatever it is, right? And even after that, rejected, God still allowed him to finish off his term, 40 years as a king. Fire comes down from heaven and kills priest Aaron's boys. Burning strange fire. One guy named Uzziah, fire comes down. The Bible has the word exploded. He just exploded, right? His whole body exploded. The fire came because he touched the ark. He just touched. That's all he did because it was falling, right? It was falling. So he's like, oh, I'm going to catch it. God killed him. I mean, what's the big deal, right? I mean, it's like you can say, oh, no, I was just helping. It doesn't fall on the ground. Why you? Why? He went to hell, you know? Aaron's boy, strange fire. What does that mean, right? They have a procedure. God has a procedure. Do you understand? He's like, okay, if you're going to bring fire to the, you know, the, the altar or whatnot, it has to be done this way, this way, this way. You need to be clean. You need to go through this and this. And they're like, you know what? We're just going to do what we want. <laughs> Destroyed. What's the big deal? What's the big difference between... One step, if I miss one step, what's the big difference? Right? What if I brought fire from the torch instead of lighting it here and going through the steps? It's easier, right? It's easy. Let me just bring that. Boom. They're, they're in hell. What's the difference for eating from this tree and that tree? God, why, 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 why are we condemned and, and cursed? Because I ate 
from this tree. No, it's not about the tree. It's not about the fruit. They listen to the devil. That's what it's about. Okay, they listen to the devil. If you listen to the devil and you do something, you make a right turn listening to the devil, it's not about the right turn. It's about you now sold yourself to the devil. That's what it means. You submitted to his authority. You saying, I'm going to be loyal to you, devil. And now you become an enemy of God. Therefore, you're going to get judged. What about Cain? He brought some vegetables. Come on, God. I worked so hard. I'm sweating. God's like, reject it. Go do right. What's the big deal, God? I got, I got corn? Beans? Kimchi? Fried rice? What's the big deal? That's not what I wanted. That's what God's going to say. That's not what, who, 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 who you guys think I am as God? Do you, what, am I just a little midget here? Go, hello. And we're just going to do whatever we feel like because we have no fear of God? Oh, you just, you have no idea, okay? You have no idea. You know, maybe, maybe APC need to remind us occasionally about that dream he had. He had the fear, okay? Imagine, if, if, imagine if, if you're forsaken by God, And you're going to hell, like, there's no hope. What kind of fear would that be? I don't think any of us experience anything like that, right? I mean, it would just probably be terrifying. I mean, even a PC was so, he was like, it's so terrifying. It's like, he, you know, he's, he woke up with a sweat. And his wife had to do this. Are you alive? He's frozen. I know I'm making it funny sometimes, even though it's serious. Sometimes it could be fun, but it's fun, you know? It's fun to me because I'm free. <laughs> you can't touch this. <laughs> but if you're guilty, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so why don't you get free then, right? Amen. Do right. That's what God says. Just do right. You know, he said to Cain, hey, I'm not going to, I'm not going to hold it against you. I'm not going to punish you. Just do right. Why are you getting sulky? Why are you getting all pissy? Why are you wanting to go kill Abel for, right? Just do right. Go get a lamb that you got in your stock. Bring it and let's kill it and have a barbecue. And then you'll be fine. That's it. That was it. One decision. Do you understand? One decision and the descendants of Cain would have been flourishing. But now, you know what descendants mean? Your future. Your children and your future, either blessed or cursed. Oh, no, they're my, you know, people I'm never going to see, so it's not my problem. Yes, it is. Your future is your problem. Your life, up to that point, that's, that could be considered your descendants, right? All right. We'll stop there. All right, let's give the Lord a hand. Thank you, God.